Welcome to the first of our video lectures in which we'll be able to explore some of the details that we are forced to either skip or merely summarize in class. This lecture uh, covers some details from chapter 1 and section 1. The first thing that we want to discuss is what is statistics. We mentioned in class that statistics is the science of drawing conclusions from data. If you wanted to say a bit more, you could say that statistics is a mathematical science that's concerned with organizing, summarizing, and drawing conclusions of measurable reliability from data. One of the details I'd like to talk about just for a moment in this video lecture that we are drawing conclusions of measurable reliability from data. If we look informally, say, at the means from two samples from two different populations, we could certainly come to the conclusion intuitively that uh, the two populations, say, have different means. What we can't do intuitively is to say something like, and furthermore, we are 95% certain that our conclusion is correct. That's the sort of thing that good quality inferential statistics can do for us, and we will learn to do that as we move through the course. Right at first, however, we'll just be talking about some intuitive and simple ways of getting some basic conclusions from our data. Statistics is quite a young field. Uh, for instance, your grandparents really could not have taken the course that you're going to be taking here, at least when they were your age. And the reason is much of the content of statistical science was simply not known at that time. A great deal of it has been developed in the lifetime of your instructor, and in fact much of it has been uh, developed since I finished graduate school. In contrast, say Euclidean geometry was around 300 years old when Jesus was on, his, on this earth. So statistics uh, has grown into a vast field, and it's grown very quickly, really over the last several decades. Uh, really, it's grown to be so large now that no one could be an expert in all of it. Statistics is uh, divided into two major subsets. First, we call descriptive statistics, and the second we'll refer to as inferential statistics. These two subsets are not of the same size. Descriptive statistics is much smaller uh, and easier to learn than inferential statistics. It nevertheless is the place that we start. It consists of methods for organizing, summarizing, and presenting information. By that we mean we'd be using charts, graphs, tables, and various other descriptive measures, such as averages, uh, measures of variation. Uh, if we were to rank things in order, we might say that this is the largest or the other is the smallest, something like that. All of those are examples of descriptive statistics. For instance, if we were to look at our classroom, we could estimate the center of the age distribution, for instance, by computing the median or the mean of the ages of everyone in our classes. Or we could talk about the number of children uh, in your family of origin. We could make some kind of a graph from that then, and that would help us uh, to understand what the distribution is like as we move from one person to the next throughout the whole class. A statistic, in distinction from statistics as a field, means any single measure or description of a collection of the individuals that are under study. For instance, if we ask everyone's age in our class and computed the average or the mean of those ages, that mean would be a statistic. Inferential statistics we'd like to talk about next, but we need a little bit of vocabulary before we can describe that in detail. First of all, we need to understand the difference between a population and a sample. A population, in statistical terms, is the collection of all the individuals or the items that are under consideration in our study. So, for instance, if we heard that President Obama has a 34% approval rating among all American voters, um, then we would say that the collection of all American voters, uh, probably those who are registered voters, would uh, comprise our population. The sample, on the other hand, is that part of the population from which we are actually obtaining information. In this example of uh, the approval rating of the president, 
1,500 people, say, are selected and then surveyed in order to come up with that statistic. The 1,500 people are the sample. All American voters would be the population. As another example, say this class were 60% uh, female students. Then we might conclude that um, our, our university student population, approximately 60%, are female. Our class would be serving then as a sample of the entire population, which would be all students at the university. Now to talk about uh, inferential statistics. Inferential statistics always involves first a population, that is the set of all individuals or items that are under study, and then a sample would be those particular ones that we're going to be looking at. In general, for instance, the population is very large or it is inaccessible so that we can't study the whole of it. The sample, however, is small and accessible. So we study the sample in order to infer conclusions about the population. Sampling then involves selecting a subset or a collection of individuals that we want to study and inference means the process of reasoning in a quantitative way from the sample back to what the population must be like. Descriptive statistics then merely describe what we see in a population or in a sample. Inferential statistics infers features of the population based on observations of the sample. Let me give you an example of that. Suppose it were true, and by the way, it probably is not, that McDonald's restaurants were to report that 12.8% of their minimum wage employees have a college degree. Well, then we might conclude that approximately 13% of minimum wage fast food workers have college degrees. What would we be doing? Well, we would be saying that we are sampling out of all minimum wage fast food workers, we would be looking at those that work at the McDonald's chain restaurants. And then we would be inferring, uh, assuming that what happens with the McDonald's restaurants is actually what happens with all such restaurants and uh, making an inference about that population. Well, let's talk then about where data comes from. First of all, when we start thinking about data, we have to uh, distinguish between two different kinds of sources, and that is whether our data come from observational studies or from experimental studies. Data that comes from experimental studies are very different from those in observational studies in the kinds of conclusions that we can make. Well, the difference uh, between these studies is that observational studies merely observe patterns that already exist. They do not impose any conditions. As a matter of fact, in observational studies, we tried hard not to influence the outcomes. We want to merely see what is already there. In an experiment, however, we are imposing conditions that we call treatments in order to, to observe the results or the consequences of imposing those conditions. In experiments, then, we are deliberately imposing conditions to observe the changes that are induced. Here are two examples. Suppose, for instance, that we want to study the effects of uh, some certain kinds of fertilizer on corn crop. Well, we might apply, uh, say, urea, uh, which is a source of nitrogen, to our corn crop at the rates of 0, 10, or 20 pounds per acre. We could then observe uh, the difference in yield between those three groups, the parts that receive the 0, the 10, and the 20 pounds per acre. In this case, we would be imposing the treatment of 0, 10, or 20 pounds of urea per acre and observing the results, and therefore this would be an experiment. Here's another example. I've heard many times that homeschooled children significantly outperform public school children on national standardized exams. This, by the way, is actually a true statement. So is this an example of an experiment or of an observational study? Well, this is an observational study because we are not uh, taking a selection of children 
imposing homeschooling on some and public schooling on others, and then looking to see that what the differences are in their national standardized exam scores. On the contrary, families are choosing on their own whether they want to homeschool their children, or put them in private or in public schools, and then we are, uh, after they have made that choice, the pattern is already established, we come in and observe the pattern that already exists. So the first example, that with the fertilizer, is an example of an experiment. The second example uh, with homeschool children is an example of an observational study. Now, why would we be so interested in drawing a distinction between experiments and observational studies? The answer is that only experiments can conclude that we have a cause and effect relationship between the treatment and the difference in outcomes between the treatment groups. For instance, a study of elementary school children measured several variables, and those included uh, shoe size and reading comprehension. It turned out that there was a strong correlation between larger shoe sizes and higher reading test scores. So does that mean we can conclude that bigger feet cause better reading comprehension? Would it be a good policy to start stretching out children's feet so that they can read better? Well, I think we all know that would be completely ridiculous. The reason that we can't conclude cause and effect here is because uh, this is an observational study. We are not causing some children's feet to get larger or preventing them from getting larger and seeing the results uh, in terms of their reading comprehension, but rather we're simply observing a pattern that's already there. What is at issue here is this principle, namely that association is not the same as causation. In other words, the fact that these two variables, the fact that larger feet, higher reading scores are related, does not mean that one causes the other. Now the reason is, of course, that in observational studies, we have the possibility of what we call a lurking variable. A lurking variable is a variable that is important to the outcome of the study, but it is not measured directly. In the case of the reading scores and shoe size, there's an obvious lurking variable uh, in the study, namely the age of the children. The older children have both larger feet and higher reading comprehension, in the case of the higher reading comprehension, it's simply that the children are more mature and have had more instruction and more opportunity to learn to read better. So it is actually the increasing age in time in school that is the cause of the higher reading comprehension test scores. This relates to real controversies. Uh, many of them are found in medical and health sciences. Uh, for instance, a recent study showed that women who receive annual mammograms do have a significantly lower risk of dying of cancers of all kinds, including breast cancer. So is this study alone convincing evidence that mammograms and early intervention prevents cancer deaths? Well, the answer actually is no. In this study, it was not the case that a number of women were selected, some of them were given annual mammograms, and others were prevented from having them, and uh, then we observed a lower death rate of cancer in the group that received the mammograms. In fact, the way the study proceeded was that those women, women decided uh, for their own reasons, whether or not they would receive mammograms, and those who decided to get them had a significantly lower risk of dying of cancer. Now let's suppose that we could do an experiment like this. In fact, we cannot for ethical reasons, but let's assume that we could. Say we had a group of 10,000 women that are recruited. 5,000 were chosen at random to receive an annual mammogram an appropriate treatment if cancer is discovered over a course of 10 years. The remaining 5,000, uh, we actually prevent them from ever being screened, and they're treated only if cancer is discovered after symptoms develop. Let's suppose that the treatment group had then fewer cancer deaths. Would this argue 
that annual mammograms and early treatment prevent cancer deaths? Well, if this story were true, then the answer, of course, would be yes. The unscreened group is the control group. We have compared the two groups with only one difference, namely screening and early treatment. So the difference between the groups, because of the large size of the groups and the fact that the groups were separated out at random, uh, the differences are almost certainly due to differences in the treatments, namely that some of the women were given annual mammograms and early treatment and others were not. Of course, ethical concerns prevent us from ever doing a study like this in the real world. Or at least I should say, they prevent us from doing that in the modern real world. I'm sorry to say that we've come to these conclusions ethically because sometimes such studies actually were done. For instance, the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male was begun in 1932. In it, 600 black men, 399 who were already infected with syphilis, and 201 were not. These men were offered free mails and burial insurance. The study actually, though, had a purpose that was hidden from the men who were offered this treatment. Namely, that the intention was to document the effects of untreated syphilis, and then uh, having documented those effects to be able to use that to justify uh, public programs that would treat black men who were infected with syphilis. In order to do this, the study actually intentionally withheld effective treatment for syphilis from these men. The study was only halted in 1972, that would be 40 years later, when a news story uh, caused a public outcry exposing what was happening to these men. The federal government, because of the uh, tremendous uh, public outcry, uh, had to agree even to pay reparations to these men and to their families because of the harm that they suffered due to this study. Uh, so ethics really do need to be uh, considered in research. Uh, I think almost all of us would recognize today that this was a uh, highly unethical thing to do to these men, uh, and yet it was done at a point earlier in our history.